So we're going to have a wet team today and a dry team. You all know who you are. Uh, catching the animal will be myself, Will, and Christine, so that we can move the animal quickly and efficiently. Again, the goal is to have the shortest amount of water to water time. From the beginning, no one had expected her to live. Each hour that passed was further proof of her hard-fought struggle for survival. And each hour that passed brought the little whale they came to call Inky one step closer to returning home. She was about to embark on an exhausting four-hour flight. For Inky, it was one more step in a remarkable journey. A journey that had begun five months earlier on a beach in New Jersey. It was Thanksgiving Day and a young pygmy sperm whale had stranded. Bystanders and police protected her until the Brigantine Stranding Center arrived on the scene. Dozens of phone calls activated the Marine Mammal Stranding Network. And by 10 o'clock that night, Thanksgiving dinners up and down the East Coast had been put on hold. The U.S. Coast Guard agreed to do an emergency airlift, taking the whale by helicopter to a hospital pool at the National Aquarium in Baltimore. I did not give her much of a chance at all for survival when I first saw the whale. She was in a very poor condition. She was dehydrated, appeared to be in shock. She had very poor muscle mass and muscle tone. Uh, she was a perfect example of an animal that uh, would not survive long uh, without proper and immediate care. A lot of times when we get these stranded animals in, it seems like there's little hope. They come in emaciated. The Kogia species, which Inky was a member of in particular, hardly ever make it past about a week in a rehabilitation setting. And I think we all felt when she first came in that, oh, not another one of these poor animals. I think there was a lot of skepticism to keep plugging away and keep moving on and, and putting in the time and the resources to save her because they just don't do well. Good stay. In Baltimore, the aquarium's medical team began an intensive series of examinations and medical tests to discover what had caused this young whale to strand. It was clear that she was an unhealthy animal. She was unable to move. She was uh, logging at the surface, a very strange behavior. It seemed as though she was uh, not going to improve. Her, she was eating very little, uh, and she was not gaining weight, and she looked as though she was in trouble. After three weeks of blood tests, x-rays, and sonograms, Inky was still alive, but the source of her illness was still a mystery. It was when they called in endoscopy specialist Dr. Michael Wise that Inky's problem became all too clear. Because we know that animals like her uh, often have ulcers, and so we were examining her stomach for that purpose, and didn't find ulcers, but did locate uh, some what appeared to be foreign material. We were able to determine her primary problem, which was actually plastic that was stuck within her stomach. We found numerous types of plastic within the animal's stomach, including part of a, a mylar balloon, what looked to be the cellophane wrapper of a cigarette carton. Um, there were other pieces that resembled a green garbage bag. But this is an animal that's stranded for a single reason, and that's because we throw junk in the ocean, or we throw junk where it shouldn't be, and it finds its way into the ocean. The number of strandings has been going up regularly uh, for a number of years. And since we are finding more animals, we're looking harder at those animals to see what's happening to them. And we're finding marine debris uh, very frequently. 
that shows us that our everyday garbage and our everyday activities actually have impacts on the environment. Recent reviews have shown that there's up to 130 marine species that are infected by entanglement and up to 160 species that are known to ingest marine debris. So we're not only looking at marine mammals, but we're looking at sea turtles, seabirds, fishes, and even some invertebrates. So the whole spectrum of the marine ecosystem is impacted by marine debris. Keeping garbage out of the oceans is a mission the United States Coast Guard takes seriously. Presently, laws prohibit dumping trash from boats and ships, but in reality, most of the garbage found in the oceans is washed out to sea from land-based sources. Garbage from our city streets and wayward party balloons often end up adrift in ocean currents. By enforcing anti-pollution laws and educating the public, the Coast Guard joins the Environmental Protection Agency, National Marine Fisheries Service, and other organizations in a massive effort to reduce the amount of garbage, particularly plastic, that finds its way into our oceans. The cost of cleaning up marine debris is enormous. It's a cost that could be dramatically reduced if each of us takes personal responsibility for keeping trash away from our waterways. Once we removed the plastic from her stomach, she was able to eat more. But her muscles were still really stiff and weak from the trauma of stranding, and she could hardly swim. Volunteers encouraged her, sometimes inch by inch, to swim forward for another bite of her favorite meal, squid. Aquarium staff, with the help of over 80 volunteers, monitored her progress 24 hours a day. Volunteers often swam with her to provide both mental and physical exercise. As the animal regained its strength, began to eat, its behavior changed to be more of what we would consider normal for this species of animal. And in that, the animal moves very rapidly at times through the pool, will spy hop and uh, porpoise about the pool uh, in these periods of high energy output. She has played in the water before after the medical procedures, but never this in depth. She went right for it and had her head in there and seemed to be echolocating, moving her head around, using her echolocation. She's going back right now, just kind of in there playing around. Maybe getting a little back scratch, back rub. Inky is a scientific treasure. It is an animal that lives alone at sea, an animal that has never been able to be observed at sea for any period of time. So this has been a golden opportunity to uh, see how they behave. In fact, the name Inky came from her species' unusual ability to produce a cloud of ink. When she's fearful or, see, or approaches prey, she'll actually defecate in a way that uh, produces ink that she has stored, we think, blinding her prey and only she can locate the prey within that ink cloud because she's able to echolocate. She's able to use sonar to find that. They're just moving the hydrophone back and forth in front of the whale while we record here. Audio recording expert Dr. Sam Ridgway discovered that Inky's sonar is the highest peak frequency of sound produced by any whale ever recorded. She's making head scanning movements. As fascinating as she had become, the goal was to return Inky to her natural habitat. After weeks of planning and rehearsal, Inky made a strenuous four-hour flight to Florida on a Navy cargo plane. Give me about two or three minutes, we'll be on deck. We're like 10 miles out now. Okay, let's we're good. We're good. head first into the truck. Keep it, keep it level. At Marineland, she spent four weeks readjusting to an outdoor environment. Just six months ago, Inky had been emaciated and near death. But she had made remarkable progress. 
gaining 125 pounds and growing 14 and a half inches. Now she was ready to go home. Inky arrived at Port Canaveral before dawn. She would travel aboard a research ship provided by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. The Relentless would carry her into the Gulf Stream where she would have the best chance to find plenty of squid. We're right on schedule. It was a smooth trip for her. She's feisty and ready to go. Yep. A radio transmitter had been custom made to fit on Inky's dorsal fin. Designed to come off after about four days, it would send out signals to be picked up by special receivers on board the ship. The radio pack tells us where she is, her swimming patterns, it tells us her dive patterns, and all of that information we can put together and come up with a pretty reasonable guess as to what she's actually eating and therefore how healthy she is. No one's done this before in the sense that we've actually been able to track the animals, uh, a little pygmy sperm whale like this. We don't know what to expect. We're going to put her back in the ocean and see what she does from there, and we hope she's going to do well. Inky had come a long way on her journey. She had traveled thousands of miles on helicopters, trucks, airplanes, and ships to find herself suspended precariously over the Atlantic Ocean. can do. Perhaps uh, we started it by putting plastic out in the sea, which she consumed, brought her to us. So in that sense, we didn't do such a good thing. But now we've uh, taken the plastic out and we've put her back out. We've learned a lot in the meantime, and we're going to continue to learn as this voyage continues. That's her. So she was just down for a little over a minute, and then she's coming up for a successive uh, succession of short dives. For four days and three long nights, the tracking crew plotted Inky's course. She was heading north, staying right in the middle of the Gulf Stream. So far it's been, been just great. The nighttime patterns, for example, indicate that it's making these very long dives. We're hoping that it suggests that it's going deep to feed on the squid that it uh, normally feeds on. On deck, everyone focused hour after hour on the open sea hoping to catch a glimpse of Enki. As we searched for a sign of Enki, found lots of debris. Found a plastic fork, a plastic laundry bottle. We found an inflated mylar balloon. What really concerns me is that she's still out there and that she has another opportunity to consume these plastic items or other debris. Worries about Inky's condition were calmed considerably when she finally decided to make an appearance. Yes, I got her. All right, I got her this time. Still up, logging at the surface, kind of a rest, resting there. But the tag looks fine, Andrew. It's about 700 meters. We approached Inky in a small boat, and we were able to actually come within 10 yards of her. She took her head, pulled it out of the water, and looked at us as she had so many times before when she was with us in Baltimore. It, uh, it made me feel really good. You know, she looked fine. We saw her a couple times, and that was it.
to see her about 48 hours after the fact being released was quite uh, a good thing to behold. That told me kind of in a nutshell that, hey, she's doing okay. Hey, I'm out here in the wild and I'm doing all right. It should be disturbing to all of us to know that there are animals in trouble out there right now because we put plastics in the ocean. Inky couldn't tell the difference between garbage and food, but we can, and we're the only ones that can prevent this from happening again.